A beautiful orchestration of code, lasers, and machine learning, driverless cars offer us the promise of harmonizing our congested streets, reducing air pollution, and keeping our streets safe, rescuing us from our own human fallibility and error. Software is being designed so at the touch of a button, these driverless cars will know when to pick you up, where to deliver your groceries, and what time you need to be at work. They'll also be able to pick up you and your friends after a wild Saturday night out and make sure you get home just OK. Parking will be a thing of the past. So will those pesky parking tickets, and not to mention driving around and around trying to find the perfect parking spot. Freight will be careening down our highways in platoons, driverlessly, making sure our online orders get to us on time. These cars will be driving around, creating beautiful 3D maps of our world. Ladies and gentlemen, we're at the frontier of a new mobility revolution. Code is a new concrete. Lasers are the new eyes on the road, and data is the new fuel. Now, back in 2013, in my formal role as Deputy Executive Director at the University Transportation Research Center at Carnegie Mellon University, it's a mouthful, I helped to execute a 33-mile driverless car ride from a suburb of Pittsburgh to the Pittsburgh International Airport. In that car was the chair of the House Transportation Committee and the former Secretary of PennDOT. It went off without a hitch, five years ago. Since then, I have lost two of my nearest and dearest friends. Andy Fisher, very much later that year, in 2013, lost his life, and then just two years later, my friend Susan, to senseless traffic fatalities. I'm not alone in my grief or my frustration. 40,000 people lose their lives every year in the US alone to traffic fatalities. 1.3 million the world over. So as an expert in this field, autonomous vehicles give me hope. We need them to fulfill their promise. But we need to make sure that they work for all of us. And I'm just not convinced we even know what that means yet. So let's go back to parking. In New York City, 2017, they raked in $545 million in parking ticket revenue alone. It's a lot of parking tickets. <laughs> it's a lot of money. So on an individual level, those parking tickets are annoying at best, but on a grander scale, they are funding our roads and our infrastructure and making sure that we don't have to drive over those potholes. As a good friend of mine in, our, in Mayor Peduto's office likes to say, the way we fund infrastructure in this country is toast. And what about all of those parking lots and on-street parking spaces that are just going to be freed up? because no one will have to park. These cars will just be driving around. And what about them? Are they just going to be circling around and around, waiting for someone to call them? And those beautiful 3D maps of the world? We're just handing over our data and our privacy. And the companies, they don't, they don't want to know just how we're moving. They want to know our every move. So how do we, the people, reap the benefits of this technology without any of the harms? You see, what's become so clear to me is that while brilliant minds are designing gorgeous algorithms, they might be missing one major piece of the equation, humanity. So how can we, the people, make sure that our social values are orchestrated into this new revolution, tailored to our community needs, addressing such issues as affordable housing and justice? How can we be ensured that our data is being balanced with, with privacy 
And that implicit bias isn't just being programmed directly into the code. You see, in my world, when I travel around the country, I hear city officials saying over and over again, they just need the data. They want the data from these companies. And are they sharing it? I don't think so. In our transportation system past, we have let cars lead the design of our system, of our roads, and our communities. This has cut off neighborhoods, driven massive suburbanization, and created inequities across the board. But now, we have an opportunity to engage. Think about it with me. So, we're letting these car companies develop their products on our roads in the public right-of-way, using our data and using us as the crash test dummies? What if we demanded that they shared that data with us, or they shared some of the insights that they're learning about us, we the people? And what about those beautiful 3D maps of the world? What if we could use those in our cities, in the planning departments, to develop powerful insights about what's going on in near real time? What if we actually just turned industry on its head and we had community leading this data nut? What if we just said, we're going to collect it ourselves, neighbor to neighbor, peer to peer, and then we'll create community data trusts and license that back to industry? Because, you know, they might know where we're going and where we're coming from using their services, but what they don't know is where we can't go and why we can't get there. And what about those parking tickets that I was talking about and all that revenue? How are we going to fund our streets? Well, what if cities could start ensuring that autonomous vehicles paid for the services and the resources that they're using? What if we charge them per mile? And how are we going to creatively reuse all that space all that real estate from all of the open parking lots and on-street parking? What if we decided to be creative and have those address some of our social ills, like affordable housing and food insecurity? We could have multi-level developments that are affordable in our parking lots, and we could have roving, fresh food carts along the streets throughout the cities. That's just two ideas. And what about all those cars? Again, are they just going to turn our streets into rivers of congestion and pollution and threatening our safety? Well, let's see what's actually happening right now. On the federal level, they're a little uncertain about this technology. So they're making it only voluntary for these companies to submit their safety plans to them for review. So what does that mean to you and me? That means we cannot be assured that the cars that are on the road right now have plans in place to assure, ensure our safety. What about safety standards? We have automotive industry safety standards for things like brakes, seatbelts, airbags, developed in the 60s. We do not have any standards for the software that's being put in the cars that are being put onto our roads. What if we, the people, required that a third party had to review that data and that code before it was put onto our streets? <laughs> when you write a book, you always have an editor review it before you send it to publication. And so what are states doing? States are a little bit all over the place uh, and trying different things out. In California, right now, there does not have to be a human in the driver's seat as long as you can control it remotely and there's someone licensed somewhere in the car. In Pennsylvania, they're trying out a different collaborative approach. They're working alongside AV testers and trying to create policy that does not hinder innovation, but that does ensure that we are safe on our streets. And on the local level, local governments are trying different things, and I'll give you a few examples. In New York City, in 2017, 
Mayor de Blasio launched the Driverless Future Challenge, which partnered community with design thinkers to reimagine how they could use their streets, and I've mentioned some of those ideas already. This was a community-driven process, and it was very much driven by the mayor's office in partnership with the American Institute of Architects and Fast Company. In San Ramon, California, a few miles outside of San Francisco, they're testing driverless shuttles that can have 12 people moving at a time that they first tested on a closed track, and when they put them on public streets, they allowed them to be operated by their public sector partners. It is exactly these sort of public-driven partnerships and initiatives that we need to see more of. We need to see more trial and error and more creativity. This is how we can ensure that our future is designed, driven by our values. We, the people, ultimately need to make sure that as this revolution unfolds, humanity does not take a back seat. Thank you. Thank you.